Reaching back at the contemporary history of Moorish science as a coined concept uh, in terms of the founder of the organization of the Moorish Science Temple of America, Incorporated, uh, approximately 1923, Timothy Drew gained an awakening and then as the legend has, because we don't have any proof that he broke away from the Masonic order and founded the Moorish Science Temple in Newark, New Jersey. And prepared is what is written on the bottom of his pamphlet, the Koran Circle 7. And of course, created all kinds of uh, friction among the Orthodox Muslim who uh, thought he was trying to write another Bible. He got on it because, for two reasons, I think. One, there was little knowledge going around black America about either Islam or esoteric knowledge. Two, because blind faith blinds an individual to seeing beyond the surface of things, which is true of all religionists. They see what is there, and they believe what is there. The, the very cover of Dr. Ali's book does more than suggest the man was giving a deeper perspective of knowledge and, and a path of learning that supersede not only belief system, but even that bit of information that's in the Koran Circle 7. The first thing that should be noted and is not by most Muslims, and I keep referring to Muslims because Negro Christians don't read the Quran until they get into the Masonic order and get their 32 degrees and they receive a Quran, which is simply another perspective of the same belief system of other names and another name for the Creator. Beyond that, I don't know what they, they know or study. This is the transliteration of the Arabic characters of Qua or Ka or K. The brothers and got all sophisticated with how they pronounce it, so I don't want to get into that. But what we immediately note that these two words are not spelled the same. This is where that word comes from. The Al Quran Lodge or Koran Lodge is one in Cleveland and one in Chicago and a couple of other cities I have noted in my travels. And it did not dawn on me that they were different words and that they were when I did know that I still didn't know what the hell it meant. Again, which exemplifies the, the blissfulness of ignorance <laughs> until the spirit broke it down for me. And even to this date, this distinction has not been clarified even among the brothers in the temple. Again, because they are part seekers of knowledge and part believers, which is a hell of a line to be on. It makes for unbelievable confusion. Be one or the other. Believe until you know, and when you know you need not believe, you become the doer. This is a code word, N not a word, but a code word. This is supposed to be an O, -O there, make that distinction. begin this uh, lecture with my little uh, repeat of C.C. Uh, Wynan's song, uh, everything, nothing remains the same, everything must change. 
the young become the old. The, 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 old, the young become the old. Mysteries must unfold. Very appropriate for this level of knowledge. I was so impressed with the woman's beautiful voice and how much sense it made in relationship essentially to universal law. The, the first pursuit of the seeker of truth is knowledge. He or she is not looking to believe anybody except him or herself. As the higher self reveals to that one, his or her truth. Okay, truth is not in a book. Truth is power. There are as many degrees of truth as there are a 360 degree circle of the concentric. The circle of the concentric. 360 degrees, 360 degrees, 360 degrees, 360 degrees. We're talking about the con continuity of infinity, which is circular, not straight line going on and on and on forever, but different dimensions of that cyclical change that more reports itself geometrically like this than it does anything else. The only problem is we, we don't travel from one point in the double circle to back to the double circle in one lifetime. Very few there are those, but they, those are always the reincarnated Maha masters in search of infinity. So knowledge is the K, order, the O, rhythm, the R, astrology, the A, nature, the N, is Koran. Okay. The, the difference between the believer and the seeker of knowledge, the seeker of truth. We're going to talk about order in this spiritual echelon today. Where's my eraser? I shouldn't, shouldn't have dirtied up the board here. You know how poorly this eraser performs, but it's necessary. We already know that the scripture reports the concept more in the quote Hebrew term Misraim, one of Ham's sons. This is quote the Hebrew word in retranslation, translate back. One comes to in consonant retranslation, an abbreviation of Mazura or Morse for Moor. Ham is not Ham, it is Cam. Cam is not Cam, it is Cam Moor. Cam means black fire, primal essence. And we already know what Moor means. Then there is the alleged and legendary idea of La Muria. That's where this abbreviation comes from, thanks to the European Academian who renamed it the continent of Mu. <laughs> but Mu is significant in symbology because it is the sound that the cow makes. Why the cow is a sacred animal in India and the Indian East refuses to eat the cow because it makes the holy word of Mu, which when you reverse Mu, you have Um. Um, um, a um. Okay. In Revelations chapter 5, verse 11, you find the definition of more. 
Revelations chapter 5. One of you good Christians have your Bible with you? Turn to Revelations chapter 5. Let's see if I'm correct there on my assumption. And even pull my notes out here. I must really be getting heavy. I don't need any notes. <laughs> you got it, my sister? You left yours. Here's one you can use. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody found it yet? can tell you all ain't used to opening this book. <laughs> Ma'am? I found chapter 5, verse 11. Uh, oh, what does it say? No, it does not say uh, what we... Okay, that's not it. Thank you. Is it chapter 11, verse 5 then? <laughs> I got it marked, but I... I quit trying to whole verses in my head so I won't sound like a street preacher running off quotes from the Bible on the street. I thought it was first. Uh, Chapter 11, 11, 4. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. How does yours read? These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Okay. Okay. So it, it, it uh, differs in different translations. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses is how it begins in verse 3 and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth okay. translated the word more would grammatically fit into that statement, Lord of the earth. But it's not the personality, it is that which operates, animates the human being, differing him from the form animal in terms of a thinking being. The cerebral, spinal, nervous system, the sympathetic and autonomous branches are the two witnesses, the two olive branches. Olive mean in reference to spiritual oil or spiritual substance, as the spinal system produces a substance like oil that synthesizes, lubricates the nervous system and the spinal cord and the brain as well. So it's a very appropriate symbol for what makes you a human being with the potential of becoming God is the cerebral nervous system the sympathetic and autonomous branches of that system that the cow and bull and hog and lion do not have, though they have a nervous system, but not with the quality and sophistication of the human organism. Well, I wanted to start here in this scripture after doing that particular expose on Koran was with uh, Isaiah chapter 18, the oracle to Cush or Ethiopia, whatever your Bible reads. Somebody want to read those first two verses? Who has the King James translation? Not you, my brother. You read yours secondly. Uh, my sister, read yours verse. Turn right to the middle of your book. You'll find uh, the chapter, the book of Isaiah. It's right smack dab in the middle of the Bible. 18. First two verses. 
Moses? Yes, dear. Go to the land showering with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, that sinneth ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of full rushes upon the waters, saying, Go, ye swift messengers, to a nation scattered and peeled, to a people terrible from their beginning, hither to a nation meted out and trodden down. Just keep reading yours. Whose land the rivers have spoiled. All right. Now read yours. Go to the land shadowed with buzzing wings, which, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, which sends ambassadors by sea, even in vessels of reed on the waters, saying, Go swift messengers to a nation tall and smooth of skin, to a people terrible from their beginning onward, a nation powerful and treading down whose land the rivers divide. Okay, now I'm going to read mine. I just found that Bible t today. Alas, O land of roaring wings, which lies beyond the rivers of Cush, which sends envoys by sea, even in papyrus vessels on the surface of the waters. Go swift messengers to a nation tall and smooth, to a people feared far and wide a powerful and oppressive nation whose land the rivers divide. That's the real Egypt, Africa. Now let me explain that this is a translation of the American revised edition. <laughs> okay. Those are both the King James translations. In 1611 is when that particular book was made available to a special group, and it was published, but the Massasar did not have access to it. The problem is not there in England. The problem is here in America, in the South, is where this falsification of the spoiling of a people's image and status and humanity was propagated. This translation is from the Protestants' Bible, the original Bible of a Vulgate Latin Old King's English comes from the Catholic Church, not the Protestants' Church. Okay. Now, in order to get the European American to buy into this plot, this scheme of taking a people by kidnapping, <laughs> transporting them across the Atlantic into America and to be sold as chattel, they had to get good Christian folk to believe this bull crap. So the best way to get them to believe it was through what they already believed, just by adjusting a few words, you see. That was one uh, part of the conspiracy. Now, if this had been the academic and theological truth, why would they change it in 1895 when the revised standard edition of the Bible was published? Okay. Two different books, actually three. The Confraternity edition of the Catholic Bible during that period of 15th, 16th century was called the Latin Vulgate Confraternity edition. Then, of course, it became King James's version, who did not write one comma in the book himself. But they were about the business of doing a hoax on their people and miseducating, misdirecting the illiterate African Moor in Europe. What type of Bible was that prior to, prior to the King James version? The Catholic Duye. Catholic Duye. Confraternity, available? yeah. It's still available. In fact, the, the, the Catholic Duye reads with the first verse you read, go swift messengers to a people tall and smooth skin but it does not include terrible from their beginning, okay? 
which means if you look at that in a literary sense, because you can't look at it in a metaphysical sense, it is not metaphysical. It is a tampering with. You recall Elijah was telling black folks back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s that they had tampered with the Bible. But he never, if he did, he didn't make it that public what they tampered and where they tampered, you know. But they sure tampered, there's no doubt about that. This is why the problem of psychological inferiority as a psychosis is so strongly ingrained in black folks' psyche and the subconscious level. Now, they just did a piece on this book titled Success is in our, Runs in Our Race. It's written by a European during the period of slavery where uh, this one guy took some excerpts from it and was stating his name was something Lynch, and he was stating that it, it is not good business to lynch the slave because you reduce your manpower. It would be better to uh, diminish his image and create conflict among them, and this conflict and inferiority would last for generations. That's how sure he was of the plot that they had conspired against the African. Virtually would ruin their psychology. Okay? And look how long it has lasted. That's part of it, yes. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. So again, to unravel this mystery of why we're on the bottom, that's not the only reason, but it certainly is part of it of people who cannot perform from their conscious mind cannot, not only cannot succeed, but cannot aspire, cannot reach their lofty goals. A people who have been driven to conflict among themselves, to lie to and about each other, who believe themselves to be niggas. The straw boss was a black boy. Can't call him a man. He wasn't a man. Who kept the slave in line. Then he had a straw boss that kept him in line. If he didn't beat the slave, watch the slave, then he got beat and stomped. This has not gone away on the deeper psychotic level of subconscious okay, is what and where the problems are stemming from that we are experiencing even in 1997. Okay. So it's still important to deal with the subject of the illusion of inferiority, the learned illusion. Someone keeps telling you, you're nothing, you're nothing, you're nothing. Pretty soon some part of your own mind will believe it, even though you can visually see that you're not, not what they're saying. You know, in particular, you look around and you see the sun peeling their bodies to dry chafe, and it doesn't do that to your own body. You've got to wonder. You know. So here is part of that evidence in terms of theological presentation by the good Reverend Biscuit White to the good Christian White. See? And of course the black man was not allowed to read the Bible on the penalty of death. <laughs> yes. So we know he didn't have anything to do with that conspiracy directly or with the changing or altering of those terms. <clears throat> Okay, I want to make sure you have access to that bit of enlightening <laughs> information. Uh, the seven represents, I should have done, finished that, but I'm, I'm trying to do several things here at once. The seven represents, first of all, physical perfection. 
Then secondly, it represents the seven planets. If you look at the circle as as sorry a circle as that is, on the on the cover of the Quran, it's it's like it's made like this. A slight suggestion of the four parts of the circle, which automatically gives to the student of the science of astrology first the cross and the four cardinal points, which immediately takes that student right into the zodiac, immediately. There's no problem with that. Thereby appreciating the codex and scriptus of the word term Koran. Then, of course, that alludes to the 12 parts of the circle, and the 12 parts of the circle alludes to the 12, 12 signs of those parts and the meaning thereof, which gives you the science of astrology and the study of nature. <clears throat> Knowledge comes from nature. The perfection and the maladjustment of nature is the educator on this plane. The man of the East becomes a student of nature. The man of the West becomes a student of his economy. How much he can do with sell. The, the interesting thing about the European, he's been able to sell all four elements to profit on all four elements, air, fire, water, and earth. He sells it all probably the first time in human history that has ever happened. They can sell you and will sell you air. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. The concept of order, according to one, though it becomes debatable, that the most important law of the universe is order. Well, the most important law of the universe is the one that starts the universe, and that's vibration. With no vibration, there would be no order. But if they're all equally important, you can't virtually categorize one law above the other. That's intellectual thinking, not wisdom. Among the 12 sons of Jacob, <laughs> though we know there are 13, <laughs> we wonder which one represents the sign of cancer. And as I go on looking through the small groups of astrology books that I have that do deal with those signs, all the astrologers don't even deal with them. They just kind of put it on the side. Most of them picked Issachar which is wrong <laughs> and I part of the part of the pleasure of this is this rediscovery and again it's because they did not look up and find the def the metaphysical definition of those 12 names or 13 names virtually so they drew conclusion of the sign based on fact other than the meaning of the name okay in terms of the sign Now, I'm supposed to have my damn chart up here, and I don't have it, so let's do this. Kind of a big chest there. Didn't need a bigger chest, didn't need a head for this one. Turn to Genesis chapter 49. <gasps> Verse 
verse 13. Zebulon shall dwell at the seashore, and he shall be a haven for ships, and his flank shall be toward Sidon or Zidon. Now, turn to Deuteronomy 33. Verse 18, and of Zebulon he said, Rejoice, Zebulon, in your going forth, and Ishakar in your tents. They shall call peoples to the mountains. There they shall offer righteous sacrifice, for they shall draw out the abundance of the sea and the hidden treasures of the sand. Okay. The next thing you do is turn to your metaphysical dictionary and look up the name Zebulon. Okay. How many of you all got the, uh, the uh, metaphysical dictionary? It's imp it, it, it is not can be. It, well, if you're going to be a student, it's important. Is that one? I want to go yeah, uh -huh, yeah, uh -huh, yeah. Page 689. Did you bring yours this time? <laughs> Good. You want to read that? You got it? Read it out. Still waiting to hear somebody read. Surrounded, habitation, dwelling, abiding, neighbor of one household. Jacob's tenth son. And the son. No, stop right there. Surrounded, habitation, dwelling, abiding, neighbor, abiding neighbor of one's household. Okay, what does the what is the descriptive of the crab? Does anybody know? What's the first thing about the crab that you can descriptively state that fits the definition of Zebulon? Shell. He's what? He has a hard shell. Well, well, what is that hard shell? For him, what is it? But that's his house. And he carries it with him wherever he goes, does he not? Okay. First key. The other, of course, is habitation as a term, and then dwelling is the other term, okay, in terms of what the name itself defines as. is the descriptive, definitive of the sign, not vice versa. It's like retranslating from the given definition of a name to the symbol instead of the symbol to the given definition of the name. Okay. Now, it is also partially given. Now, the trick is this. The Kabbalists combine the two names, which further hides the fact of Zebulon instead of Ishakar. Remember, it says, and they, okay? That was the, the, the real trick, the they factor. So, A, by knowing that you're talking about 12 and not 13. B, by knowing that you're talking about a hidden code, makes you intellectually suspicious of what is being said and how it is being said, okay? Keeping in mind this level is about not knowledge, hidden knowledge, <laughs> okay? The Kabbalist deliberately even in his revelation, still hid knowledge in terms of key terms, key words, and key symbols. And Leah conceived again, bare a sixth son to Jacob, and Leah said, God hath endowed me with a good dowry. Now with my husband dwell with me. Now will my husband dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. She called his name 
Zebulon. A good dowry. What is one of the attributes of the sign of cancer? Money. <laughs> Home. Bank. <laughs> Security. Yes, okay. All Cancerian attributes. Okay. And he shall be for a haven of ships. What does the word haven mean? Anybody? Like a resting place or yes, right. Very good. Yes. yes. Shall be for a haven of ships. Haven. Security, safety, any place of shelter. Okay. Further descriptive of the sign of cancer. Now, some translations will read with the word... Okay, let, let's see. The turn to... Uh, where's my... Genesis 49.13. Turn to Genesis 49.13. Let's see, I think that's where that, that section is. And he shall be a haven for ships. What does yours read? Read that verse. Somebody read that verse. Verse 13. As a haven of the sea, and he shall be for an and he shall be for an haven of ships, and his border shall be unto Zibbon. And his border shall be. Okay, yeah, that's a that's the word I was looking at. Let me see here what I got. Now one of the other Bibles I had, the word tra translated for border was flank. Okay, and his flank shall be. In fact, it's in this one here. Verse 13, and he shall be a haven for ships, and his flank shall be toward Sidon, or Zidon. Anybody know what the word flank means? It will be interesting. Right, the first thing it suggests to us Westerners is something military. The side of an animal or person between the ribs and hips. The thin piece of flesh constituting thus part of, which is the diaphragm. Okay. Anybody know where the mouth of the crab is? Where? No, it's not. Like now it, t it, it gives you the key here in this peculiar verse. Let's see here. In Deuteronomy 33, verse 18 and 19. And they shall call peoples to the mountains. There they shall offer righteous sacrifices, for they shall draw out the abundance of the sea. Okay, read, your, read verse 19 and see what that word draw out becomes in your translation. Deuteronomy 33, verse 19. They shall call the people unto the mountain. Mm -hmm. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, but they shall suck of the abundance of the seed. 
and of the treasures in, in the sand. Right. They shall suck of. That's how a crab draws in its food. Its teeth are in its stomach, not in its mouth. Okay. What is the other peculiar behavior of the crab that gives him away in this text? It's right there in the little verse just below that. For they shall draw out or suck out the abundance of the sea and the hidden treasures of the sand. Yeah. So what does a crab do in the sand? Anybody know? He digs wells. He's the well digger. Very peculiar behavior. So by reading the, again, the definition of Zebulon, one finds synonymically a representation of the sign cancer. Okay? Now, what I wanted to do was read the descriptive of the sign cancer. The symbol of cancer, the crab, represents possession and retention. It carries its house on its back. The symbol is drawn from the breast, emblematic of motherhood, to nurture cherish to ripen carry to bear although it has land it has land travel faculties the crab is a creature born of water that's the navel the place where order is to be found and also the meaning of the word Nava, navel, navy, which means what? What does it, what does it mean? Thank you. And cancer is one of the what? signs. Thank you. Okay. So the symbolicism of the name brings you back to the sign. And that's what most of the astrologers didn't, didn't bother with. Uh, what's her name? Carrie Perry did in part, but she doesn't, she doesn't acknowledge metaphysics which spoils her little cup of tea, which is rather strange, because she believes that uh, cell salts will solve all the problems. What's found in the sand, again, other than water? That's right, minerals. And where are they dissolved? <laughs> in the stomach. <laughs> Symbolic representation. The antinomical correspondence, cancer has dominion over the zone of the body containing the breast, chest, stomach, and therefore related to the pancreas and thoracic duct. The bones, it governs the breastbone, the ribs, which are nearest to the stomach. The muscles, the intercostals, those between the ribs. In terms of what the word flank means, okay. it, it gets to be a unique recording of the Kabbalistic writers when you break this stuff down. You know, somebody thought this stuff out before they wrote it. You know, it's, it really gets to be beautiful when you see it. You know, 
and then allows you to dispel with the mythics, the things that people believe and don't understand. They believe in because they're in the Bible. If you ask somebody what the verse in Genesis chapter 49 verse 13 meant of a Christian congregation, 98.9% .9 of the time they could not tell you and probably wouldn't even be interested because it doesn't say anything about Jesus. That's ignorance of the highest report in a time when a people are perishing due to lack of self-knowledge. Okay. I think I've covered all my notes there. This is a symbol of order. And the principle of order points out its value in terms of if the body is not in order, if the body is not functioning, it's going to flunk, fail. If your life is not in order, you're not going to succeed. If your mind is not in order, you're not going to succeed. There can be no success without order. That the universe constantly dictates order is a major standard of what we see in universal astronomical viewing. The universe does not make any mistakes. Even the horrendous debris that is thrown from our orbic atmosphere, 80,000 tons of astral dirt rocks daily is not a mistake. The fact that this planet tilts on a 23 degree angle, 15 minutes, allows for us to experience what Vulcan does not experience and other cold planets do not experience, four different types of seasons. And the appearance as if the sun sets and the sun rises when it does not. The angle of this planet allows us to experience night time on one side of the planet while on the other side of the same planet is daytime. <laughs> okay. So we can, by studying nature, we can see the order of nature, thereby understand the reality of what we are calling God, which is universal intelligence, and universal power, universal energy, intelligent energy, a field of energy as mind, and whomever embodies those attributes becomes the Lord. The Lord and law are synonymic. law. But that wall is invisible. If you run into it, <laughs> it'll let you know it's there. It doesn't move. You can't break it. You can't transgress it. It is the Volkswagen going up a one-way street and here comes a Mack truck. That's universal law. It doesn't change. So we move with universal law to get done the things that ought to be done by us. Major key factor that each one of us has something to do. And if we wonder why our people are in such chaos, because they're not on their spiritual post doing what they are supposed to be doing. Because we're lured into a fun world. Was it uh, Henry Ford that wrote in Protocol, uh, America is ruled by or Hollywood is the biggest influence in America and is ruled by make-believe and evil. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> and we see it. I mean, we see the dynamic influence of Hollywood on the cultural consciousness of Americans. This country culture lives for fun. You know? The pleasure syndrome, which is glandular.
and glands without control makes a slave. That's what a slave is. Who, he who has no control over his or her glands not only has no control over their glands, becomes a slave, becomes powerless. And we are certainly still a people who think they are powerless. They think they are powerless as a man thinketh, <laughs> so is he. Okay. I agree that uh, writing, writing yourself mm. in a world uh, that's obviously uh, wrongly ordered is a difficult process. Say something you just spoke about in the West. Yeah. Uh, there isn't any right order for a world for a culture. A culture is a organization, organism that's growing. You can't put a world in order unless its people are in order. Well, just deal with this society, this Western we, we, we already know it's out of order. What we do not recognize, it, it has never been in order. Okay? That's not only true of the Western Hemisphere, that's also true of the Eastern Hemisphere. In our millennium, when we look at the grand cycle of things, the golden age of man, we're talking about another kind of human being. We're on the devolutionary, revolutionary end of the cycle. We're not on the evolutionary end of the cycle. We are revolving to evolve. That's a swing up. Up here are those that were at the pinnacle of their divinity, who could think as God, who were guided by God because they were gods, the majority of people. That's a whole different concept. We're not even trying to deal with that. That's the literatures of legends and myths. You know, the, the quote, the ancient of days. We're talking about the developing soul, the evolving soul, the awakening soul. That, that's the order world we're in. World meaning, you notice this, this concept is not used in the Bible. Have you noticed that? That's not used in the Bible. It's called lexiconographic writing. That's what world means. The old word. The word that in the beginning that became flesh. <laughs> okay. We live virtually in a symbolization trying to bring about a civilization. But without an understanding of that symbolization, we cannot bring about a civilization. The language of symbolism is the language of nature, of divine intelligence, that man is given the privilege of translating. The privilege of translating. If you wonder why most people don't know the language of nature, because it is a privilege. So the rest are simply looking from the outside out rather than from the outside in. A little gem of wisdom I found. <laughs> I love this stuff. Genesis 49, 28. Underline this little precept. Genesis 49, 28. About these chosen 12. <laughs> <laughs> which has gotten to be a, a, a real problem among black folks since these Hebrew Negroes are walking around with their damn noses in the air like they really are the chosen of God. Not all of them, but there are some that are a bit snooty. 
Anybody found it yet? Okay. Read it out loud. All these are the twelve tribes, tribes of Israel, and this is it that their father spake unto them and blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing, he blessed them. Okay, I guess that's good. Enough. Gather together and hear, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Is, is that where, where, where am I at? 49, 28, I'm sorry. 49, 28, I'm sorry. Okay. All these are 12 tribes of Israel. And this is what their father said to them when he blessed them. He blessed them, every one. <laughs> okay, there's the key right there. He blessed them, every one. <laughs> Not twelve. <laughs> every one. Okay. That, that puts it into the circle of 360 degrees and the twelve signs representing the 12 blueprints of human personality characters on planet Earth. Instead of a little bitty island broke off of Africa, about to float off into oblivion. <laughs> Don't mean to ride derogatorily Israel, except Christians have made it bigger and larger than life. That's part of the, again, the the spoiled psychology of black Christians because we knew for sure the Jews were all white and God was white and Jesus was white <laughs> there <laughs> and it's a part of getting past that psychology to get the stuff out of your mental way so that you can see the blazing star, the diamond in the rough, so that you can see Amen, the hidden God. <laughs> that, that's what truth seeking from an Afrocentric point of view is about. It is not accepting somebody's belief system, no matter how eloquent or charismatic they may be. Billy Graham. <laughs> Cracker, a graham cracker. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I haven't got all that order here. Damn. But uh, it, 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 not, it not was a problem. It is still a problem. You know? When they fill up one of those stadiums, almost 40% of the population in those stadiums listening to Billy Graham are black folk. And, and, they, and they are going to heaven. I mean, you know, there's no doubt about it. You know? You get your hair, you get your robe. Get your crown. If you don't lose it, let one of the demons take it away from you. You get to heaven, you know. And they will be almost as ignorant up there as they are down here. Because when you get up there, you got to go to school. Yeah. You got the first grade, second grade, you know. You got to go to school. Yeah. Ain't, ain't no dummies up there. If they're up there, they ain't going to be up there long. Yeah. Your dense chemical desire will draw you back down here almost the same damn day you get up on an astral plane. <laughs> you, you won't even know you was dead. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it's more than just hope, hope, wish, wish, you know? It's really about becoming. The, the term of John chapter 1 verse 12 they're given the power to become, which does more than suggest transformation. See, that's more than the suggestion. That, that's a requirement that you must become God. Which verse is that, John? John chapter 1, verse 12. The Reverend Biscuit will read it to you every Sunday. It won't explain shit. <laughs> Excuse my language. Okay, so... We pretty much have in tow the idea of 
the faculty of order, which is behind the navel, okay, your physical form truly is the temple of God, your God, not Jesus. The, the, those spiritual beings on certain planes do come and assist. You know, they do come and, and help perfect your spirituality at a certain point if you're not a fundamentalist, if you're on the path of self-realization, perfection, you get help from the, the masters and the grandmasters. That's a, a remarkable process, more secret than all the stuff we're dealing with here. You're right, you are not alone. <laughs> Never have been. But there is a place that you can fall to where you can get left alone for a season in the dark. Okay, I think I pretty much covered much of any questions, comments, commentaries, revelations, prophecies, any other good stuff such as that. I recommend The Twelve Powers of Man. Fillmore explains each faculty pretty well uh, and adds some very interesting revelations on terms in that, that particular chapter on, on the faculty of order that uh, would prove quite enlightening, uh, provided you have read some parts of the book of Genesis. <laughs> Okay, because that's where the first look is in terms of the, t the sons of Jacob. Those are the physical faculties, organs, and organisms of the body. The sons of Israel are the astrological evolving faculties of the same body. The disciples, 12, of Jesus are those that are taking disciplinary effort to develop those 12 faculties. And the apostles, 12, are those who have awakened their 12 faculties that makes up the mind of Christ. Now, I'm not going to say it again. Rent the tape. <laughs> You go from Jacob, the man, to Israel, the blessed, in the developmental process. In the Old Testament,